Hello, I'm Peter Morgan, librarian at the Hamlin Midway Library in St. Paul, Minnesota. This is our 27th year of hosting the Fireside Reading Series, and we're thrilled to be able to carry on the tradition even in this unusual year. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Fireside Reading Series from our fireside. If you were here, we would love to offer you cookies and coffee or tea, and we'd all squeeze into our children's area for the evening to listen to great writers read from their books and talk with them about their work. Obviously, this year is different. We are happy that you've chosen to join us in this new format to carry on our long tradition. And tonight, we are happy to feature Yelena Bailey with her book, How the Streets Were Made, Housing Segregation and Black Life in America. The St. Paul Public Libraries have copies of our featured author's books available for contactless hold pickup at the Hamlin Midway Library or via Library Express from other library locations. You can find all the details at www.sppl.org. I hope you're cozy wherever you are and that you enjoy tonight's event. Thank you for joining us. And here's me. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much to Peter for setting the scene. I am Wendy Worden, the Programs and Services Assistant for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, and I'm happy to be here with all of you tonight. As we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which I broadcast tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and Ojibwe peoples are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. On to our main event. Fireside is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We are so grateful for your support and your presence here this evening. We'll begin with a talk from Elena and then open things up to questions from you. And we will be following up the program with a brief survey to get your feedback, so do be on the lookout for that. And we've partnered with Next Chapter Bookseller in St. Paul, and they've created a featured page for our, our reading series. So uh, check that out if you're inclined to pick up any of the books you hear about in the series. And as Peter said, we are very, very pleased to have Elena Bailey with us this evening. Elena is a writer, researcher, and former professor of English and cultural studies. She is currently the director of education policy at the state of Minnesota's Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board. And her book was just chosen as one of the finalists for the 33rd Annual Minnesota Book Awards. So congratulations and welcome this evening. All right, thank you so much for having me. I am excited to share with you all tonight. Um, as we were planning this talk, we figured that a fireside chat made a little more sense than a fireside reading given the nature of this book. So it is you know, general nonfiction, um, a mixture of kind of historical analysis and cultural analysis. Um, so I figured my plan for tonight is to share a little bit with you about why I wrote this book and what kind of the main idea is. And then to just give you um, a couple snippets of um, big ideas I talk about in chapter one and chapter two. So the Fireside Reading Series, as um, Wendy mentioned, is really about um, amplifying the voices of Minnesota authors and the connections between you know, being Minnesotan and the stories we tell. tell. Um, and I talk in the introduction of my book on how my experience growing up in the Twin Cities metro area really shaped and led to my work on this project. So I grew up in the northwest and southern suburbs, and I often say that my life uh, was shaped by the streets, even though I wasn't raised in them. And I say that because my mom grew up in the projects of North Minneapolis, um, and 
you know, she wanted me to have educational and other opportunities growing up that she didn't have, which for us meant moving to the first wing suburbs. And every year or two, we would move to a different apartment um, just so that we could kind of stay in the right school system so I could have those opportunities. And I say that, and I, I put this in the book as well. I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, while that worked out for me, uh, it's not to say, you know, my mom's this great exceptional figure. And if you just work hard enough, you can circumvent structural inequality, but rather that my story growing up is a prime example of how, you know, housing segregation and segregated space are about more than just physical location, but it's also about the ideas and the perceptions that became associated with black people and black space that continue to shape our lives in really specific ways. And me moving around to get to certain schools and have access to certain opportunities and my mom's worry about keeping me from the streets is a really good example of that. So my book really digs into, you know, some of the history of housing segregation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, um, but really focuses on this bigger idea that when we, you know, when we say something like the streets or the hood or the ghetto, that conjures up, right, a certain image. It almost always signifies black and it signifies certain narratives of, you know, violence and criminality. And I look at where those came from, right? So how those policies that created the physical space also created this larger kind of cultural idea of what the streets are and how those narratives end up kind of reinforcing both that separation of physical space as well as um, you know, structural inequalities that were created by housing policy. So um, a prime example of that, I'm going to start with the Twin Cities, and I did, I told them that I want to show just a couple of images. I promise that I'm not going to default to my professor mode and just give you slides the whole time, but I like images. I think it helps to frame some of what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to show you an image of the Twin Cities, because in chapter one, I try to frame the history of housing segregation in a little bit of a different lens than what um, we often hear, right? So I'm gonna briefly show you this image and I will take it down in a second. So you should see here a map that was created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1940, this is the Twin Cities area. And you'll see um, when people kind of think of housing segregation and that kind of policy, they often think of these maps, right? You think of redlining, which is the, um, you know, literal drawing red over neighborhoods that were black and deeming them as economically risky, right? So this was first taken up by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, which was created as part of the New Deal to um, help people who were close to defaulting on their mortgages or, you know, homeownership was rare then to help those who did have homes but were struggling to keep them. And then a year later, the Federal Housing Administration was created and they also did these redlining maps based off of racial composition again, where red was deemed the most economically risky, and of course, i.e. black, right? And then all the way up to green being the best neighborhoods, which were the white neighborhoods, right? And then there were varying grades along there, depending on how close you were to blackness, essentially. I'm gonna stop sharing, but um, that image of the Twin Cities is often what we think of when we look at housing segregation, right? And I think that it's important to acknowledge policies like those federal ones, and I talk about this in the first chapter of my book, um, that did create that physical separation. But in chapter one, I really ask readers to step back and think about the larger picture of how we got there. So what I mean by that is that when we get to these policies of the 1930s and that map in 1940, that's really the product or the culmination of decades long practices that were local, that were statewide, that were individual, that were really a response, a hostile response to black migration in the early 1900s. So in the early 1900s, you had what we call the great migration, um, which meant you had millions of black people who migrated from the South to the North. And they were doing this because they were fleeing physical violence, right? Lynching, imprisonment, which often for them meant being forced to work as slaves on the very same plantations that generations ago, their, one generation ago, their ancestors had to work on as enslaved people, right? So they fled that and they went to the North to seek opportunity or what they perceived as more freedom. And it was for a reason, right? Um, up until the early 1900s, there was a bit more integration, but there were very few black people. 
So um, W.E.B. Du Bois is a good example of this because um, he grew up in Northern City in a well-off Black family, and he talks about growing up with, you know, somewhat tolerance in his neighborhood, right? Um, but when you had millions of Black migrants, and I use that word specifically because it ties to kind of an unfortunate pattern we often see in this country where when there are waves of migrants from other places, there's often this reaction of hostility, right? So that's really the framing of how we get to those maps, right? So what the reaction is, is sometimes very physical um, enforcement of segregation. I talk about this in chapter one. So there's bombings of black neighborhoods, there's you know physical harassment, but there's also the beginnings of these local and city and statewide policies. So you'd have you know, in places like Atlanta, city planners would take a map and draw out neighborhoods and designate this as the white neighborhood and this is the black neighborhood, right? Then you also have, you know, on a local level, um, neighborhoods would drop covenants to say that no one in their neighborhood could sell to a black person. A good kind of local example of this, um, my best friend bought a house a few years ago in Longfellow and we were going through her deed and she showed me this clause that said, this house never in the future can be sold to a black person. Right. And so we kind of were laughing that that person's rolling around in their grave right now because this house was sold to a black person and now a black family lives there. Um, but it's a good example of, you know, how on very different levels, whether it was individual neighbors coming together, you know, um, local authorities, state authorities, city authorities, that there were these developing policies and practices that were all in response to this fear of kind of black migration. Right. So by the time you get to what's happening in the 1930s and 1940s, um, this is really just a federal kind of culmination of that sentiment. And I think it's important that we understand those narratives and belief systems that shape this policy because it helps us to see why when we created things like the Fair Housing Act in 1968, that didn't get rid of the segregation, right? Um, so what happens, the big shift you get with these federal policies I talk about in um, in the first chapter is that they really both solidify the segregation in housing and what I call geographic segregation, meaning kind of the, the racial uh, segregation along spatial areas. Um, but it also translate this into other terms that are less easy to deal with through policy, right? So a prime example of that is those redlining maps because this is where you have the translation of blackness and black space into economic logic, right? So by drawing an area around black neighborhoods, again, through local and other means, black people are forced in these spaces. And then when these federal policies came along and said, now that you're in these segregated neighborhoods, we're gonna say that you and your neighborhood are economically risky. Not only that, but then you have zoning which would put industrial areas, and we've had some really good publications lately about the environmental and health impact of that. Um, but also there was more permits for bars and um, more sex work was permitted in these black neighborhoods. And this is not to say that, you know, drinking or sex work are negative things, but that this was used to kind of create a narrative of blackness and black space as morally deficient. So what you have happening through these federal policies and what I try to do in chapter one is not just look at how you, again, created these neighborhoods, but how these narratives then began to shape around black people and their space, right? So you have the creation of black space and then it's categorization as economically risky and morally inferior. So by the time 1968 comes around and you get rid of that federal policy, the damage is done, right? And that economic logic was used by private lenders. They use FHA um, maps as well. So it wasn't just the public sector. And even today, if you think about kind of in the news, Wells Fargo was in trouble a few years back for their, you know, quote unquote, ghetto loans. That economic logic of blackness is risky or as people in the hood being morally inferior continues. And I kind of, you know, in the book talk about how those narratives serve as a way to justify maintaining these disparities and segregation. A prime example, and I'll show you one other image here, is, um, I don't know if you're familiar, hopefully you've heard of the DOT project. There were some people who put together um, maps where they had the DOT for each person based off of the 2010 census data. Um, and what that does is it gives us a picture of what geographic segregation looks like today. I'm just gonna quickly show you this. 
but you can kind of see that those same neighborhoods, we've had some shifts here and you know we have increasing Latinx population in the Twin Cities, so there are some changes, but the suburbs are primarily white and you still see places like North Minneapolis are predominantly black, right? So get rid of those federal policies, but those narratives and practices remain. And 70 years later, you have something that looks almost exactly like that 1940 Hulk map. So that's some of what I try to dig into in that first chapter. Um, the other thing that I, you know, spend time on in the second chapter and what I really was invested in the book is how then these narratives spill over into other arenas. So I look at marketing campaigns and then in the book, I look at film and literature and television and music to on one hand say, well, how did these policies and the narratives they began to shape around blackness and form and kind of seep into all these other arenas and create new narratives that justified kind of a lack of investment in black communities. Um, but also, and this is very important, how did black people, black authors, black writers and artists use their voices and their work to create their own counter narratives, right? To resist that and to really define themselves in their space in different ways. Um, so in terms of that first piece, I just wanna spend the last kind of few minutes I have of my uh, talk portion um, sharing with you something from chapter two, which is my personal favorite chapter. Um, and in chapter two, I look at how, you know, housing segregation and really what solidifies with those federal policies is the creation of, you know, an almost exclusively white suburban homeowning areas, right? So different neighborhoods and, and um, developments. And then in entirely like black urban areas that are predominantly renters or living in projects, right? And so this is where you start to take those narratives of like the white middle-class family with the you know, nuclear family and they shape, you know, different perceptions of race and belonging, right? Um, there's a book by Juliana Savolka, I think is her name, um, who um, called Soap, Sex and Cigarettes that talks a lot about how that creation of like white homeowning suburbia led to a boom in marketing, right? So you had like Tide heavy duty detergent, Cascade were invented. And you have all these new campaigns that are focused on, you know, white suburbia and the nuclear family. Um, and you see these images in Life magazine. And so as I was kind of looking into these things, I wondered to myself, well, if there's a whole market around this new idea of white homeowners, what's the narrative in the marketing happening towards black people? And what does that do to reinforce certain ideas of black people in black space? So um, you can't see the map, just the title on my screen sharing. I shouldn't be sharing anymore. Um, so in terms of how I dealt with that, I looked at Ebony Magazine because it was really the flagship magazine when you're looking at um, black marketing. Up until the 1940s, there was very little, if any, marketing targeted towards black people. Um, and so in some ways, you know, it's important to acknowledge John Johnson, who's the founder of Ebony Magazine, really transformed marketing because he went around to different white business owners and said, you know, put your ads in my magazine. This is a new market. He even partnered with the U.S. Uh, film production company to create this movie I talk about in chapter two called The Secret of Selling uh, the Negro, which we talk about that title all day. Um, but he creates this new form of kind of targeted marketing. And Ebony Magazine was the vehicle for that marketing, right? Um, so, you know, in 1962, he had about like 3.5 million in advertisement revenue. By the end of the 60s, he had 10 million, right? So it was a, it was a big deal. And these issues were monthly and they were like 200 pages long, 75% were filled with ads. So I went through each um, issue from all the time that we had these uh, federal policies going on to look through and see what kind of ads are showing up and what kind of narratives are these constructing around black people as consumers about black people and black urban identity in general, right? So what I found was in contrast to Life Magazine, which is what Ebony was modeled after, um, there were about three times as many kind of home goods advertisements in Life Magazine than in Ebony, right? So targeted towards kind of mainstream white suburban America, you get particularly home goods that were about ownership. So flooring, windows, things like that. The few home goods that show up in the black magazine Ebony 
were small appliances, furniture, things that weren't necessarily tied to home ownership at all, right? The larger thing that I noticed and found was that the majority of ads in Ebony Magazine were about food, clothes, cars, and cosmetics, right? Um, I think it was ranked out of all magazines in the U.S., and this is dozens and dozens, eighth in um, cigarettes, 10th in liquor, and I think 16th in cosmetics, right? So this is one small black magazine in contrast to all these other ones is in the top 10 in these categories. And the cosmetics were almost entirely whitening products, right? Or hair straightening. So about assimilating into kind of white beauty standards. So I really started to dig into that in chapter two and, and think, you know, it's an interesting, and I wonder if I can, someone wrote in the comments that the image didn't quite work, but I might just try to show you one as a key example here. And if they don't, when you ask questions, we can try again. Um, but I want to show you one image from Ebony. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so these are some of the images from Life Magazine and you can see, you know, very much gender domestic space here and the nuclear family and home owning. And then you have things like this and Ebony Magazine where um, on one side, you'll have them digging into these deep issues like protest and allyship and problems with white liberalism or, you know, black women and, you know, how great they are as scientists and homemakers, but the negative aspects of, you know, their dominance. Um, but right next to these, and these are on the same pages of the magazine, are these ads that are saying, if you want to be successful in life, you have to lighten your skin, straighten your hair, right? Um, so all in all, my kind of takeaway, and I talk more in depth in the book about this, is that Ebony Magazine, well, on one hand, tried to dig into some issues of racism. The advertisements cultivated this idea of Black people as concerned with their looks and assimilating, concerned with food and liquor and entertainment. And this should sound familiar, right? These are some of the kind of dominant narratives we hear today about Black people, and particularly in you know black urban spaces again going back to the past um you know morally deficient economically risky and now through these marketing campaigns they're only focused on their you know clothes and getting by and looking flashy and if they would just invest in their community and buy property they'd do better well when we hear those narratives that kind of justify the way we criminalize and treat black people well i shouldn't say we the way black people we are criminalized and treated i should say um I wanted to trace back and say, where did those come from, right? And how is that tied to things like advertising and film and television? So in a nutshell, that's really what um, the book is about. And I think that's about my 20, 25 minutes. So maybe I can open up to questions. There's plenty more I'm happy to say, but uh, as you can tell, this is a subject that I'm really passionate about, um, but I'm happy to maybe start answering some questions. Thanks very much. For, for getting into sort of what what started the the book as, as a project for you, I really really appreciate uh, all of that. Uh, as we are as we are waiting for questions to pop in, um, I can sort of start as I've got a screen over here. I should get one over here. <laughs> I keep looking behind me, um, but I am always curious when when talking to nonfiction writers, like what pieces of the research were the ones that made you forget you had a book to be writing because you were you were so deep in the in the rabbit hole of uncovering the the connections as as you were going. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, definitely, I would say the the Ebony archival footage. Um, so I don't I don't think I mentioned this. Google made Ebony magazine available online. They did a partnership. So all of these magazines are available to the public through a digital archive. Um, so I mean, I, I probably could have spent less time, <laughs> but I spent months and months and months going through every issue. And I mean, there's, I was like, oh, I should write something about this because there's so much to say about what you see in them. It was also fascinating for me to, um, I guess I'm trying to figure out the way to phrase this. Oftentimes I feel like when we look at, or when we have narratives about the past, we kind of water down the way that we're dealing with racism and things like that. But going through and reading these essays and the conversations being had, I'm like, wow, I don't even think people are bold enough to say these things now, right? Um, so I think we, 
it gave me a new appreciation for, uh, you know, the way that people were handling things in the past. I was thrilled to discover that all of those issues of Ebony were online. I was, I, I mean, for one thing, I just am kind of a nerd for old advertising period, but <laughs> it's like, ooh, all of this stuff to, to look into. Got bunches of good things coming in now. Um, and Kate is, is wondering if you looked at local newspaper ads at all, um, or if there, if there were things to compare and contrast there. It's a great question. So I was talking to someone else about this the other day. I didn't do a lot of local, local research in this book. Um, I would love to maybe as a separate project. And part of it is um, it's such a, this is like the positive and the negative of a kind of cultural studies approach is it's so expansive in that I'm giving, you know, kind of history in one chapter and then looking at, you know, uh, marketing in another and literature and then film and television and then music is that you can't go as deep as if the entire book was about one thing, right? Um, but I do that because, and I, this is me being very biased because I love my field. Um, these things don't happen only in history and policy, only in literature, only in these things. So if I want a full picture of the things that shape my life and others, I have to do and draw these connections. So I didn't do local because I was really trying to map this on a, a national kind of level in terms of, um, you know, with a larger kind of picture towards what are the narratives around race and belonging in the US and how are these connected to space? Um, so I, those are some of the driving questions that I kind of had in writing this. So I didn't, although I think that's a great suggestion. And um, if I don't, then I hope someone else does because there's so much you could dig into here. And I probably could get lost in some local archives as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, it, it, is, it is on some levels very broad, but I do think that the, the connections that you make across across the country in terms of different different cultural resonances were, were necessary towards sort of building in term and and the building the counter narrative as as you lay out what the what the issue is to start with in that in that opening section I think that was important to do um, uh, sorry, Merida, the, the book is, is uh, no, I don't have it in front of me, Housing Segregation, uh, sorry, Yelena, <laughs> Elena, would you please? Yes, so, let's see, do I have a copy? <laughs> I think I do. You can look at my library and see that I am in love with Toni Morrison if you're looking at any of my books, but if you're wondering how yep. the streets were made, uh, Housing Segregation and Black Life in America. Hopefully you can see that. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I, I had to I had to send my copy away to the second round book awards judges. <laughs> All right, I we did like several titles that my editors were like, let's try instead. Uh, so I even have to like myself remind myself this is the one we landed on, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> uh, we've got curiosity about what the rest of the book covers and also if perhaps you could read just a little bit from from in within the book um but yeah Jacqueline is is specifically curious about what you cover in other chapters and um just just to get a, a sense of of the voice of of the book I think would be great I'd have to look to see I didn't plan on reading so I haven't picked a spot um so it would be a little bit like randomly selecting, but maybe I can tell you what I do in each chapter. And then um, if you really want, I can try to look a little bit later, see if there's a part to read from. Um, I do think, I believe that um, UNC Press has made the first bits available to preview online. So if you did want to just kind of preview it. And then again, you can get it through your local library. Um, but I will say, um, so the first chapter is a lot of that history. And I dig more into, like I said, the narratives and those kind of practices to draw those broader patterns. Also, a lot more attention than I was able to do tonight into the kind of economic um, disparities that result directly from this. I mean, again, there's been lots of good writing on this, but um, 
very little awareness. So uh, Yale, there was this Yale psycho like psychology study a few years ago, and I mentioned this in the book, where they surveyed white Americans on their kind of perception of racial progress. And uh, people estimated that black Americans had 80% of the wealth of white Americans, when in reality, they found it was 5%, right? So the, the perception of, of how far we've come and then the relationship between housing policy and the racial wealth gap is still not there. Um, so I dig a little bit more into that um, in the first chapter. And then chapter two is all about marketing. So I talk kind of the history of marketing and relationship to black people, but it's really about Ebony Magazine and what's happening there and how they come along to on one hand dealing with housing segregation while on the other hand can you know, contributing to these narratives that actually re-solidify negative perceptions of Black urban space. Um, in the third um, chapter, I dig into literature. So uh, I am, I mean, I love literature, film, music. I, I swear I shouldn't pick. But I talk um, about three Black authors in particular. Anne Petrie, who wrote one of my favorite novels called The Street. Um, James Baldwin, and I look at uh, The Fire Next Time, and then um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me, to look at not just like, here are their books, but they are talking in really interesting ways across decades about this idea of the streets or Black space as something that really shapes Black life in all these unique ways. Um, and then the positive aspects too of, yes, we're segregated, but it, it allows a space for community and um, you know, often a space of reprieve from, you know, the racism you experience in other parts of the city, right? So I spend some time on that in chapter three. And then in chapter four, I believe, I hope I'm not mixing that up, that's the music chapter. Um, I have to talk about hip hop because it is the genre that is tied to the streets. So it's literally birthed in the streets at black parties. They would siphon off electricity from uh, the lighting poles and have these black parties. And so, you know, talk a little bit about that history, but really I dig into um, the Fugees, Lupe Fiasco and Kendrick Lamar as artists that have these concept albums that really think about the streets and black space in these unique ways. Um, and to counter, again, these narratives that have been shaped about black people and black space by humanizing um, and giving nuance to black space in ways that, you know, maybe aren't done in other genres. And then finally, in the last chapter, I look at hood genre films of the 90s, and I talk about Moonlight as like taking that, but going further in many ways. Moonlight is still one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and then I talk about television, and I know that many people's favorite thing is The Wire, and I talk about the good that's done by The Wire, but I also offer a critique of the limitations of that um, when we talk about how it depicts black space. Um, finally, in the conclusion, because this is extremely important and because my students when I was teaching uh, would always push me in this way, and this is what I love about Gen Z. Uh, I spend time on like, what do we do about this, right? So what are possible avenues we do to rectify, you know, and deal with these structural inequalities? Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of what the book is about. There are so many questions here. There are so many good ones. I do want to call out this question from Lucia, age eight. What did it feel like to write your book? That is a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're in the process and you do it because it's a labor of love, I think for me as a writer, it feels like this is something I know I need to say and I just have to find a way to say it. And so I'm just working on that. And then once you're done and you put it out there in the world, it's kind of surreal and vulnerable. Um, because you write something because you think, well, I imagine this is the same for fiction and other writers. You just have the story that you wanna tell, whether it's a story about the streets or whether it's a story about your life um, and you have to get it out and it's a good feeling. Um, so if you like writing, I would encourage you to keep writing and to do it for yourself and the story you wanna tell um, and to not let yourself be afraid to put yourself out there. That's great. Um, a question about uh, inequitable advertising and, and influencing, how can we and our students influence inequitable advertising now? Maybe this comes from a marketing, you know, someone teaching marketing, maybe, it, you know, it's, yeah, it's a good, it's a good open question. Uh, 
That's a great question. Um, so I'm definitely not a marketing expert, but I think with anything, and this is really my large point in the book is that we need to spend more time thinking about what the impact and the narrative is that, that, that piece of advertising is contributing to or what it's coming from, right? I think often, and you hear this when kind of there's critiques of films or anything out there, it's like, well, it's just a movie or it's just an ad. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a cultural studies scholar. I'm always like, no, it's never just a movie or an ad <laughs> because it creates ideas. And these ideas, whether we realize it or not, determine how we perceive and treat one another, right? And so I think whenever you're creating an ad or teaching people about advertising, I think knowing history is huge. I think knowing context is the key. Um, so that when we have ads and I've, you know, there's been some, I can't recall a good example right now. I'm sure maybe someone in the audience can, where you'll see an ad and you're like, oh, if they had just had a different writer in the room, <laughs> they would have known that was not the way to go with that, right? So having the right people in the room and having the right knowledge of history and context is how we don't reproduce those narratives. One of the things that I absolutely loved about at the conclusion especially, but it was it was a through line was that idea of telling the stories of America differently and more and more accurately and more, you know, with more awareness of the complexities of, of the story and stories. And, and I think that's, yeah, what you're saying is super, super important to call out. Um, Trevor is wondering uh, if you could speak more about the sorts of counter narratives that, that people are creating in response to this, this phenomenon of, of pigeonholing people into the sort of metaphysical streets. It's great. Um, so I'll pick a couple, like, let me, I talked about Anne Petrie and I talked about literature and I mentioned um, this idea of both recognizing the limitations and the kind of negative impact of the streets while also claiming it as a space for community and you know reprieve from racism. But I'll give you two examples from Moonlight and I'll pick Kendrick Lamar because uh, somebody mentioned that. Um, so these are the two things that come to mind. I think they're really good examples of stories and you know music that um, use their art to allow black people and particularly black urban people to live in complex nuanced ways. So if I think of Moonlight, for example, and I hope everybody's seen it, <laughs> I'm not gonna get spoilers, I don't think, but um, you know, when you have like the hood, the hood genre films of the 90s, they were often, you know, on one hand trying to share stories and these are filmmakers who grew up there like John Singleton, right? And, you know, show like, this is what it's like, but it was always kind of this individual who was fighting against the elements of the streets and somehow overcame it, right? And, you know, when you get 20 years later, 25 years later to Moonlight, you know, that film resists that and instead tells a story about black space where you have someone who is simultaneously, you know, a mentor and caring and nurturing and affirming of, you know, this young man's, you know, uh, sexuality while also being the tough drug dealer, right? Like it's not an either or. And I think that's hard for people to acknowledge the both and of humanity, right? Um, so that's one example of how people are telling stories that say, I'm not, I'm gonna resist the idea like Ebony did back in the day of like, well, maybe if you see me as middle class and, a, and someone who can spend money on things, you'll respect me, right? Um, I think Moonlight says, I'm not trying to make you necessarily respect me. I just want you to see me as a human being who can both do this and that, you know, who can be nurturing and kind and also sell drugs, right? Like there's, I think that, that there's power in not trying to like earn your humanity through respectability. So I think that's one example. And I think Kendrick Lamar does that through, um, I talk about Good Kid Mad City as the, as the album I look at. Uh, and he does it through his persona KDOT. And it's just this, on one hand, this carefree young man, like there's backseat freestyle, which people were trying to analyze and they're like, what is this about? And it's just this kid who's goofing off with his friends in the backseat saying ridiculous things about money and women. And, and really it's just the idea that why can't a, a young black kid be silly and have fun and have that same element of humanity that we grant to other youth, right? Um, so I think those would be a couple examples where artists are, are claiming that complexity. 
I, I loved, I, I, I'm passingly familiar with, with that Kendrick Lamar album and uh, I, I loved that sense of like, this is, these are just kids in a car. And, and I do remember that sort of deep dive on, on that album when people were like, what does it mean? What does it mean? Like, I don't know, it's a bunch of kids. Like, what, what do you think it is? <laughs> it was just really, again, I enjoyed that you pointed that out. Um, a process question about writing in general. Um, can you can you touch a bit on what your editing process was like, and did the editing keep the essence of what you wanted to convey? Sorry, I had to unmute. So you know, this book was unique in that it I was I'm like on the edge here of um, it's published by University of North Carolina Press. It's an academic book, and there's kind of a a process that that requires. But I went into it when I put the proposal to my editor saying, I'm not writing an academic, traditionally academic book. Like I'm writing a book for the general public because I think that again, when I talked about that Yale study and people not knowing the disparity is so big, like it's one thing for 20, you know, people with PhDs to know and talk about this it's a, in like, you know, high theoretical language that <laughs> other people aren't gonna read. It's another thing to say, why don't we have this conversation with people who are just as like interested and intelligent in the community in language that is, you know, accessible, right? Um, so this book both had to go through those normal academic processes of, it had two rounds of peer review, um, which means I had senior scholars, you know, saying, you should go this way and do this. And in some ways that was super helpful because um, I think it made this book stronger ultimately. But it, it was definitely a process, a lot of me trying to push back and say, I want to do this without sacrificing who I'm writing this for, right? Um, the best piece of advice I got from my advisor in grad school was, write something that your parents will read and enjoy. And that's really what I tried to do with this, right? Um, and my parents have read every piece of writing I've ever <laughs> done. Um, bless them, because some of it in grad school yeah, they're good people for, for that. But all that to say, it was um, it was unique in that respect. Um, and there, there, you know, there's always compromise. But I had a really great editor, um, and I think that he helped me find that balance. I want I want all of these questions. I'm just really like, <laughs> um, Eric is is answer is asking uh, what was the impact of your high school education on exploring a, and detailing segregation because apparently Cooper High was one of the most segregated spaces Eric has been in. Uh, and how was your experience at a PWI Christian undergrad informing your your motivation for digging into your subject? Is this one of your buddies? <laughs> this person knows a lot about you. <laughs> that was me and where I went, uh, fellow Cooper alum. Um, yeah, so I'll start with Cooper because uh, it's an it was an interesting space in that again it was a predominantly students of color and indigenous students, right? Um, and we had, you know, this was back when they were doing the busing system of, uh, you know, uh, students who would have attended North went to Cooper, right? So they were trying to, you know, that was their solution. Won't go there. So anyway, the school was when you weren't in the IB program, which is what I did, we went to that school so I could have access to, you know, my mom was like, you'll get a private school education at a public school. And that was what we could afford, right? So I went to Cooper High School. And even when we had to move out of the neighborhood, I caught multiple buses and, you know, just to get to that school, right? Um, so it was jarring because I would go to lunch and be other places and, you know, on one hand I fit in, but I'm also read very differently and was disciplined very differently. Um, and then when I was in my classes for the IB program, it was me and I was the only, so I'm, um, I'm uh, multi-ethnic, my, my dad is Ethiopian, my mom is African-American. I was the only African-American and there was one Ethiopian student. We were the only two black kids in the IB program. Um, so in a school that is, <laughs> was very black, we were the only ones. Um, so, it, you know, it was a jarring experience to deal with that and to deal with, you know, I work in the education system now, teachers who did not expect me to both be in or do well in that program. Um, so 
yeah, it was jarring. And then I, for whatever reason, went to a um, predominantly white Christian college. Well, I went there because I was a physics major and they had one of the top 20 programs in the country and I wanted to stay close to home. So I was like, I'm gonna go to this college. Um, and I won't get into it, but it was uh, a very jarring experience because that was a, I think there were maybe 14 black people all the four, four years I was there and we all know each other. Um, so it was very different. And I do think those experiences shaped my writing about this book because more and more as I moved in and out of spaces, I realized I'm being seen through the lens of where you think I belong, right? Your assumption that I bust in from North Minneapolis or, um, oh, you're from the city, you must have, you know, X, Y, Z, or this is your name, you know, things like that. Um, so those were experiences that, again, helped me think about the streets shape the way Black people are perceived wherever they are, right? So wherever I am, I'm seen as belonging to that space and not in this program or this neighborhood or things like that. It's also plenty of stories I could tell about me and other black friends in the suburbs of our college uh, being pulled over and things like that. But that's, I think, stories for another day. <laughs> we, need, we need to have stories with Elena for another day. <laughs> it's like there's so many. I am working on a memoir now, so that'll be my Yay. next thing. <laughs> you, that answers a question that's, that's down here. I, yeah, that's really, really great to hear. Um, Peter is asking us, hi, Peter. How do, how, do you dis, how do we disentangle the economic effects of redlining and segregation without negatively impacting cultural institutions and community, avoiding the perils of gentrification? That is an excellent question. Um, I was thinking about this actually, I think you all maybe saw in the news that proposal um, to address what happened in the Rondo neighborhood, right? And so I've been thinking a lot about the best ways to approach something like that. So if you're not familiar, there's that proposal to, uh, you know, try to undo the, and there's a lot of these urban renewal projects in across major cities where, you know, um, highways were built. And it was interesting because they were meant to help fast track people from the suburbs when they had to work downtown in the cities. And then they would go through these predominantly black and brown neighborhoods and often, you know, decimate them, right? So Rondo is a prime example of something like that. And there's this proposal to cover up the highway to kind of restore the neighborhood. And I think this is a good kind of case for like, how do you deal with the economic issues um, or the kind of physical segregation? while also realizing again, like I've said, artists and communities have adapted to that and defined themselves and grown in different ways. Um, so it's not as easy as just undoing that, right? Um, also because the, racial wealth gap has only grown exponentially. So it's just like, <laughs> there's a lot we need to do to deal with that. Um, my biggest answer for that is you always have to let those communities lead that work, right? Um, because they know what is essential and has changed and what needs to stay in terms of culture institution, in terms of you know what parts of that community should not shift and what parts can and do, right? I think that's you know the issue we get into with gentrification is these things aren't led by the people there in those communities. So I think that um, I'm obviously a big advocate for redress when it comes to, you know, the impact of housing segregation. But I think that because so many things have, like you said, been entangled and compounded over time, the people who are impacted by that, both living in those spaces and outside, have to lead the work of what that means for them and their communities, right? And I think that um, starting local is always best in that regard because a big sweeping kind of uh policy isn't necessarily gonna be the best fit for everybody without me going into more <laughs> yeah and it, it feels you know less maybe less overwhelming if you think about it on a, on a hyper local sense first um, which works better for for this brain anyway um, finding finding time for a, a few more here, um, and I just want to also relay that that you know people are thinking making great connections with other with other books that they've 
they've read, um, you know, Sarah Broom's The Yellow House and um, just good, good, good things for you. Um, uh, where was this question? Oh, curious about what you learned about the people who, who did migrate and how they responded to redlining um, compared to violence that they were fleeing. So I would imagine this is talking about the that that you know migration that you mentioned early on. So that's an interesting question because um, and I talk about this like a few places throughout the book. Like, like I try to be very careful in um, acknowledging that there was some space at least initially where it felt like, oh, at least in the Northern cities, we have reprieve from, you know, the massive lynchings happening in the South, right? Um, but over time, one, I try to be very clear in the book that like that dichotomy of North and South is a false one. And, you know, lots of people have written on that. Um, but over time, all of that violence, just that explicit dominant violence ends up kind of following people, right? I mentioned that, you know, black neighborhoods that were established were bombed, right? <laughs> um, neighborhoods, people were beat up. Um, there's one instance where, you know, neighbors started a, like, a, I mean, I laugh because I find history, like you laugh so you don't cry, like history, you're just like, wow, I can't make this up, right? They started like a white supremacist club next door to this black family and like raised the flag and play loud music. Um, so, you know, these things followed them, right? Um, so there, there's differences, but it's fluid, I guess is what I want to say. And then we also obviously saw over time changes in law made it so that things like that imprisonment they were fleeing in the South, you know, well, black codes were more prevalent in the South. The narratives and the things I'm talking about came to justify the increased imprisonment of Black people in the northern cities, right? It's it precisely these narratives that justified the kind of law and order policies of the 80s and 90s and the defining of Black youth as super predators. So it just morphed and took on a different way. So I think eventually you see that, that same violence, um, it just took on new forms and new narratives in the North. Um, I'm hoping that answers that person's question, but um, it's a really good question to to deal with some of the nuance there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm hopeful that 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 got to it too because that is exactly the the, the nuance that needs to be looked at. Um, and I think a lot of yeah, yes, you did, says Margaret. <laughs> um, and I think with just a little bit of time left here. Um, and, then, and Eric says, yes, laugh to keep from crying. I'm not surprised, but I'm horrified and sick has been my sad mantra since 2012. <laughs> oh. um, there was a great question here about which of which uh, Kendrick and Mufe songs are your favorite. And I just, let's, let's close with celebrating some, some excellent artists. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm slightly offended that they didn't ask about the food juice. I'm going to slide know, because As a child of the 90s, I enjoyed that little section the most. <laughs> I partly put that in there because I'm like, there are generations that don't appreciate the Fuji. <laughs> so I'm going to slide this in there. Um, so I will say for the Fujis, I'm going to say, um, I actually really, uh, I'm going to switch back. Fuji Law is probably, well, that and Killing Me Softly. But Fuji Law is really good and underrated. Um, so Lupe Fiasco, I... Um, I've been a big fan of his work. I don't really follow him anymore as much, but of that era and that album, The Cool um, is probably one of my favorite albums. It's in a very good concept album that I really recommend that you check out uh, because, I mean, he creates characters of the streets and the game and like there's this you know uh there's you know uh animations of them on the album cover like it's a very high concept album that he's really like here's what the streets are right so my favorite song on there is put you on game um it's very creepy in my mind um but it draws all these interesting connections between the kind of policies and narratives and forces responsible for geographic segregation and, you know, the forces, the same kind of patterns that he sees in 
colonialism in Africa. And so it's interesting to think about like, oh, what are the connections between these things and how is he thinking through this? Um, so that's just a really good song. Um, but um, I think what there's one of those is like a mainstream song in that album, but that's my favorite one. And then for Kendrick from that album, my favorite is Mad City. Um, I think it's a great song just to listen to, but also such an interesting song to think about the protagonist, like literally being asked where he belongs to determine his safety, right? Like someone's like, where are you from? Where do you stay? Like, that's all what I'm trying to say with this book, right? Um, but as far as my favorite song, I would say the XXX, which is a song that uh, features uh, Bono is my favorite, probably. I mean, All Right is obviously great because it was an anthem and it's BLM and, you know, but um, I really like XXX because I think it's a great piece of music. So I'll just, sorry for nerding out a little bit about my favorite song. That's why I asked. Talk more, but yeah. <laughs> give you that option to, to do so because why not it's it's fun to it's fun to, to wrap up on, on i know i will say my regret in the book is that i couldn't include uh buddy who is a artist that has been around for just a few years who has a really great song called trouble on central that really reflects these ideas of black space so just gonna throw that throw that out there fantastic i really really appreciate your time this evening and and i'm excited to hear that you're that you're writing a memoir because i you know i i the personal sections in the book have a fantastic voice everyone out there who hasn't read the book read the book because it's it's fantastic and yeah really deserving of its of its spot in the minnesota book awards finalists and worthy of attention and i'm Glad, glad you're here. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Thank you, Hamlin Midway Library. We wish you were here. We were there, something. <laughs> and and do do come back uh, next next week. We're talking to I'm talking to Carolyn Holbrook about about her memoir. And I'm really looking forward to that as well. And everyone is expressing much love for you, Elena. So Thank you again. And Have thank great... you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>